Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Philemon. Little book, one chapter, very important book, very practical book. And so far, we've looked at three things in the book. Uh, we've looked at Paul's prologue, we've looked at Paul's prayer, and Paul's petition. And we mentioned that Paul's prayer and Paul's petition to Philemon to forgive Onesimus was very important because apparently Onesimus, this runaway slave, uh, had taken something from Philemon. But Paul prayed and Paul petitioned that Philemon would forgive him and subsequently restore him, but not out of duty, but out of desire. Not because of the law, but because of love. And what a valuable lesson we learned last time we were together that yes, we should always do the right thing. But we need to make sure we do the right thing for the right reason or with the right motive, right heart, we would say. And that was Paul's desire last time we were together. Well, this brings us to verse 17 through 25 in our study for today. So let's pick up our reading in verse 17 in the book of Philemon. It's only one chapter. And we'll read down through the end of the book. Philemon beginning in verse 17. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, <laughs> not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. <laughs> yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you your spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Now, if you're taking notes or outlining our study today, we're going to be looking at two final thoughts here in the book of Philemon. First of all, uh, we'll take a look at Paul's promise to Philemon in verses 17 through 22. And second, we'll look at Paul's parting words for Philemon in verses 23 through 25. Now, in this first section dealing with Paul's promise to Philemon, we want to look at that in light of six things in verses 17 through 22. Uh, note them carefully. Six things. Number one, the first thing involves the command that's given. The command that's given. Uh, let's take a look at verse 17 again. In Philemon, verse 17, Paul said, If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. Now, the command that's given is to receive Onesimus. But it's interesting to note um, the very first word in verse 17, that little preposition if, it's in what's called the first class condition. We would say since. Paul is saying, since I am in fact a partner, a co-laborer, a fellow servant of Jesus Christ, Philemon, I want you to receive Onesimus as though you were receiving me. Now that's an amazing and an incredible command coming from Paul. Because you recall that Onesimus apparently had taken something from his master Philemon and he departed. He left this indentured servant, as it were, fled and left Philemon high and dry, if you will. Now, this word receive here in verse 17, pros lambanos, only used 15 times in the New Testament, is a compound word. Pros means toward, las banos means to take into your family, or literally to take into your heart. Boy, that really puts a, an interesting dynamic on this command. Philemon, I want you to take this runaway thieving slave back into your family. Take him back into your heart. Which, by the way, 
is the exact same command that's given to each and every one of us. You know, in Romans chapter 15, verse 7, the Bible says we should receive others just as Jesus Christ has received us. When did Jesus Christ receive us? When did He accept us into the family, into His heart, if you will? Oh, it, it's when we were no good, dirty, rotten sinners. It's when we were thieving slaves, running from God, if you will. That's when Jesus Christ received us into the family of God. That's when He took us into His heart, so to speak. And chances are, some of us here today are dealing with situations in our lives where somebody has wronged us. Somebody has bad-mouthed us or taken something from us. The Bible encourages us to receive them, to welcome them back into our heart. You say, but Clark, you have no idea what they've done to me. You, know how, you have no idea how badly they've treated me. You don't know what they've taken from me. <laughs> hey, look, I get it. This isn't an easy teaching. I understand. But that's how Christ took us. He didn't receive us because we were so wonderful. He received us. Man, when we were in the miry clay, when we were at the lowest points in our lives, God welcomed us into the family. He took us into His heart. And if that is what Christ has done for us, that's what we ought to do for others. So the first thing involves the, the command that's given. Number two. The second thing involves the forgiveness that's required. The forgiveness that's required. Take a look at verse 18. Paul said, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Now again, that little word if, that preposition, is, uh, is in the first class condition. Paul is saying, since in fact Onesimus has wronged you, and since he has taken something from you, put that on my account. Don't charge it to him, charge it to me. I will pay his debt. In other words, forgive him unconditionally and forgive him totally. Don't charge it to his account. Put it on mine. I'll pay the price. Boy, what a picture this paints of how Jesus Christ deals with us. Because when we were slaves and thieves, He forgave us. In fact, He charged our sin to His account. 1 Peter 2.24 says He bore our own sins in His own body. Jesus Christ became the embodiment of of sin, not his, ours. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus Christ forgives us unconditionally, and he forgives us in totality. And that is the example that's set for us in dealing with with others, how we should forgive others, even if they don't ask for it, even if they don't deserve it in our estimation. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, when Jesus was there on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, presumably up on a hill just above Capernaum, in Matthew chapter 6, he deals with this issue. Because in Matthew 6, 14, he says, if you forgive others of their trespass or their sin, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their sin or trespass, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. This is a pretty incredible statement that Jesus makes. And it points to and speaks of the importance of us forgiving others. This is a heavy topic. And I venture to say, some of us here need to hear it. I know I certainly do in my life. Because, you know, <laughs> oftentimes I, I'm not willing to forgive other people. In fact, I feel more like James and John in the book of Luke. Remember, Lord, call fire down from heaven and just consume them. 
Okay, you can pray for me. <laughs> Lord, just send hailstones the size of bowling balls and crush them into dust. You follow me? Does anybody else need prayer in here than me? Okay, three of us do. Fine, okay. But you know, this whole issue of forgiveness goes to our lives. Because if they don't ask for forgiveness, and they certainly don't deserve forgiveness, the problem is if we don't forgive them, God's not going to forgive us. And now all of a sudden, we become the problem. Our hearts become hardened. Uh, we become irritable, upset, angry. And pretty soon we're no fun to be around at all. Because this heart of unforgiveness is eating us up. In, in fact, Sally and I were talking about this just, just the other day. From Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. How that root of bitterness begins to spring up in our own hearts. Because we're unwilling to forgive and forget. So the second thing involves the forgiveness that's required. Let's come to a third thing in this first section. And that deals with the promise that's offered. The promise that's offered. Uh, take a look at verse 19. In Philemon verse 19, it says, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. Now there's the, the promise that's offered to Philemon. Not to mention, I will repay anything and everything that Onesimus owes you. Oh, by the way, uh, not to mention though I will, um, <laughs> that you owe me even your own self. You owe me your own life besides. Philemon, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be saved right now. You wouldn't be going to heaven. So you owe me a debt of eternal importance. So you ought to be willing to forgive Onesimus of the few little trinkets and gadgets he stole from you. Follow me? I will pay the debt. What a beautiful promise. However, I think it's interesting that Paul said, I am writing with my own hand. Why did he say that? You know, that always intrigued me. Paul is making it very clear he is the one issuing this promise. However, I think there might be something else going on here. Uh, turn over to Colossians chapter 2, if you would, please. About 12 pages to the left. Colossians chapter 2. Uh, you recall that the house church of Philemon was in the city of Colossae. So he wrote the letter of the, to the church at Colossians to Philemon and that house church. And it could be, it might be, that Paul said he was writing with his own hand to jog their memory about the letter he wrote to them about the church at Colossae. What do you mean? Well, look at verse 13 of Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul said, And you, <laughs> church at Colossae, Philemon, who's house the church is in, and you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he, Jesus Christ, has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. How? Verse 14, by having wiped out the hand writing of requirements or the, the statutes of the law, we say, that was against you, which was contrary to us. And he, Jesus Christ, has taken it out of the way. He's taken away that handwriting of requirement, the law that says you must be perfect, having nailed it to the cross. Wow. Philemon, <laughs> you were dead in your trespasses and sins until Jesus Christ removed that handwriting of requirement from you, which is the law to be perfect, holy, righteous, spiritual, to be just like God, something you could never pull off. And he nailed it to the cross in his own body, we would say. And if Jesus Christ forgave you of all your sins, how much more should you forgive Onesimus of his? Paul said back in Philemon chapter 19, I will, or verse 19 rather, I will repay. And boy, what a picture that paints for us of Jesus Christ. 
how he took all of our sins, all of our transgressions, how he removed the handwriting requirement that was against us and nailed it to the cross. Speaking of himself, taking away the righteous requirement of the law, which is perfection, so that we can have our sins forgiven and forgotten. He paid the price. How? By giving his very life on Calvary's cross for you and for me. Like that beautiful old hymn we used to sing at Calvary Costa Mesa so many years ago. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. And you know, when I think about what Jesus Christ has done for me in forgiving me of all of my sins, in taking all of my past, all of the things I've done, all the things I've said, and nailed it to the cross and totally forgiven me and wiped my slate clean, how can I not have that same heart, that same mindset toward others? Man, that's the heart of Jesus. And I hope and pray that each and every one of us have our eyes open to that glorious truth, that amazing fact. Well, it... Please, if you're still in Colossians 2, keep your finger there and let's go back to the book of Philemon. Uh, Let's come to the fourth thing we want to look at. We have to hurry up. The fourth thing involves the prophet that's desired. The prophet that's desired. Take a look at verse 20, back in the book of Philemon. In verse 20, Paul said, Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Now, this is the prophet that Paul desired. Paul was going to benefit or be profited by Philemon forgiving Onesimus. According to verse 20, he would have joy in his heart and a refreshed heart, we would say. And I'll tell you, there is something very joyful and very refreshing when we see one believer forgiving somebody else. When we see a, a, a child of God, a saint, a, someone who's born again, forgive someone else of their sin, of their trespass, no matter what they've done or how they've been treated. Why? Because that shows spiritual maturity. It shows how mature we are in the Lord, by the way, when we're able to say, okay, Lord, I totally forgive him. It's all good. And you know, that just brings joy to our heart. It refreshes our spirit, we would say. Boy, what a prophet that is. Well, number five. The fifth thing deals with the obedience that's required. Obedience that's required. Look at verse 21. Paul said, I have absolute confidence in your obedience. In fact, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Paul was absolutely confident that Philemon would not only be obedient to his plea to forgive and receive Onesimus, but he would go above and beyond the call of duty, we might say. That he would go far beyond just forgiving and restoring. Which, by the way, is exactly what Jesus desires for us to do. He wants us not just to forgive and forget. He wants us to go beyond that. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 40, there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if somebody wants to take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. If somebody compels you to go one mile, go with them too. Yeah. Talk about going above and beyond the call of duty. Look, it's one thing to say, yes, I forgive you. Uh, Yes, I receive you. But is it manifested in our actions? Is it seen in what we say and how we act? Is it seen in our attitude, our disposition, we might say? Is there a change in our countenance whenever we see that person or hear that person's name? Is everyone okay? Now, I realize none of us know what time it is. <laughs> First service was all messed up. I mean, they thought they were here at second service. 
You know, uh, a lot of the clocks I have are all digital, so they change automatically. You know, my phone, the, the DVR thing, you know, you can't change. But I do have one with the actual hands on it. I don't know what, what time it says it is, but... So half of, the, half of the house says one time, the half of the house says the other time. You know, I have no idea what time it was this, last night. Uh, but the point is, this is heavy stuff, gang. I realize it. And chances are there are many of us who are going, in, going r- right in the middle of something that, that God's speaking to our heart about in this text. But I think here in verse 21 dealing with the obedience that's required. I I think we all understand that God wants us to be obedient, to forgive others, to go above and beyond the call in dealing with others. But the one thing we all need to remember is that being obedient isn't something we work at, strive for, muster up. As much as we want to be obedient, yes, we have to have the right desire, the right heart, and say, God, I want to obey you by forgiving this person and by totally... uh, Uh, welcoming them back, we might say. But Lord, I I just don't have it in me. God, I need help. And I think that's just music to God's ears. When we say, God, I need help. I believe that's what he wants all of us to say. I think that's where he wants all of us to be. Saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I need you. And God looks down from heaven and says, right on. (laughs) My translation. Uh, (laughs) So let me give you some grace to empower you to enable you, to energize you, to be able to do what I have commanded you. Man, it's the grace. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says that we've been given grace and apostleship for obedience unto the faith. And I say praise God to that. Number six and finally, let's wrap up this first section either with Paul's promise to Philemon. The sixth and final thing involves the prayer that's needed. The prayer that's needed. Uh, Take a look at verse 22. Paul said, but meanwhile also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. God's going to open a door for me to come to you. Paul had absolute faith in the power of prayer. Paul asked Philemon to pray that God would open the door for him to visit there in Colossae. In fact, so much so, he says, prepare a room for me. I have absolute faith in the power of prayer. The interpretation simple and obvious, no doubt. Now, Paul, after he got out of two years in prison there in Rome at the Praetorium Guardhouse, house arrest, we don't know if he ever made it to the city of Colossae. I can't find any biblical reference for him actually visiting that city. And yet he still had faith in the power of prayer for God to get him to that city. Did it ever happen? Well, we don't know. That's not the point. The point deals with power of prayer and having faith in God's ability to answer prayer. Do I believe God has the power to answer every single prayer we pray. Yes, absolutely. He can move mountains. He can speak a word and the world's leapt into existence. I have absolute faith God can do it. (laughs) I just don't know if He will do it. So it's good that we pray by faith. I have absolute faith. God, I pray by faith you heal me. God, that you provide for me. God, that you lead, guide, and direct me. I think it's good to pray in in light of that. However, ultimately, prayer isn't getting my will done. Prayer is getting God's will done. Prayer is not trying to change God's mind so He comes around to our way of thinking. And I think one problem we often have in light of this involves the plans we make. 
because, hey, let's face it, sometimes we come up with some pretty good plans, amen? I mean, we come up with, we come up with a program, a plan, and we think, wow, this is just amazing. <laughs> I mean, this is, it's a spiritual plan. It's a righteous plan. It's a biblical plan. I've talked to all three of my friends. They agree it's a good thing. I've made a list of pros and cons. There's only two cons and 20 pros, so clearly it's a great plan. And then we pray, God, please bless my plan. And I can see God looking down from heaven. That's a stupid plan. <laughs> because we only see what's directly in front of us. Follow me? We have no idea about tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. God looks down the corridor of time. Therefore, His plan... So we need to take a step back. And we, need, we need to quit putting the cart in front of the horse. And we need to say, God, what is your plan? Wow. God, what do you want to do? How do you want to do this? And I'm just going to... Stand still until I hear from you on it. Wow. And you know, when God illuminates our heart to His plan, to His perfect will, we don't have to pray about it. We just do it. We just step out by faith because we know it's God's plan. So I think this sixth and final aspect of Paul's promise to Philemon becomes pretty important. The prayer that's needed. Well, back to the book of Philemon. Let's come to the second and final section, and we'll start wrapping this up right here. We've looked at Paul's promise to Philemon. Now let's take a look at Paul's parting words for Philemon in verses 23 through 25, and it involves two things. First of all, it involves greetings. Greetings. In verses 23 and 24, there are five people that are greeted. Let's take a look at them individually. Number one, the first person is Epaphras, according to verse 23. Epaphras means lovely. According to verse 23, he is a fellow prisoner. A fellow prisoner. Now, Paul had a lot of fellow... Pr you know, Paul was in jail with a lot of different people, you know. He ran with a pretty tough crowd. Um, but he, Epaphras was another fellow prisoner prisoner. Now I'd like you to turn back to Colossians chapter 4. Your finger is in verse 2. Turn one page to the right. Colossians chapter 4. Uh, because I learn two more beautiful things about this fella, Epaphras, in Colossians chapter 4. In verse 12 of Colossians chapter 4, we see he was a servant of Christ. Take a look. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, greets you. He's a servant of Christ. He's not just a fellow prisoner, but second, he's a, fellow, or he's a servant of Christ. The word servant, by the way, is the word doulos. It's our English word for slave. He was a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, as believers, as Christians, we're all servants of Jesus Christ. We too are slaves for Jesus, which means he is our Master, yes, good, two of you are awake. Uh, yes, he is our master. And a slave has no rights, can make no recommendations. He simply submits to the will of his master. And boy, what a picture that paints for us. You know, we call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves servants of God, slaves of Jesus. But are we submitting to his will? Are we submitting to his ways in our life? So the second thing we learn about him, he's a servant of Christ. Now there's a third thing in verses 12 and 13. He's a man of prayer, a man of prayer. Uh, look at the middle of verse 12 there in Colossians chapter 4. Speaking of Epaphras, he is always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and for those who are in Laodicea and in Hierapolis, the two sister cities of Colossae. So we see he was a man of prayer. Now, in verses 12 and 13, there are actually five different aspects of his prayer life. He prayed constantly. 
because it says he was always in prayer. Speaks of a lifestyle of prayer. He was always praying. Ephesians 6, 18 says to pray always. Now this doesn't mean we, you know, quit our jobs, move to the mountains and and just simply pray all day, though I'm not opposed to that. Um, it, It carries the idea that our lives are centered around Christ, that he's always in our heart and in our mind. So he prayed constantly, but notice he also prayed fervently. He labored fervently. It means to fight or to struggle or to strive. Man, he was, he was anguished in prayer. His heart was so heavy for those he was praying for. Just like Jesus, by the way, in Luke 22, when he prayed in the garden, his sweat became as great drops of blood. It says he prayed more earnestly, more fervently. But he prayed personally. He said, I'm praying for you. It's good to pray for people by name, personally. But he also prayed specifically. He prayed that they would be able to stand and be complete and perfect in the will of God. What a great prayer. You know, when people ask me, Clark, how can I pray for you? Clearly you're messed up. Uh, So how can I pray for you? You follow me? I, I get that a lot, by the way. I said, well, you can pray for God's will in my life. Because, you know, quite frankly, I'm not sure what I need. I'm not sure what what needs to happen in my life. I'm not sure how things need to be worked out in any certain situation. Oh, I think sometimes I've got a handle on this, or I I got a little information about that, and I think, well, we should do it this way or do it that way. Uh, You know, but that's just me. (laughs) So ultimately, pray that God's will be done, specifically. But he also prayed corporately because he prayed for Laodicea and Hierapolis, other cities that he wasn't even a part of. And boy, what a beautiful picture of a man of prayer. Well, back to the book of Philemon. Let's come to the second person mentioned in these greetings. We said there were five. The second person is Mark, according to verse 24. Now, Mark means a defense. This, of course, is John Mark, He wrote the gospel of Mark. Uh, He probably got saved under Peter's ministry, according to 1 Peter 5.13. He was the cousin of Barnabas, according to Colossians 4.10. In Acts chapter 13, uh, Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. But when they got to Perga, there in Pamphylia, the area of Asia Minor, he departed from them. He left them. Why? We don't know. We're not sure. But in Acts chapter 15, on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take his cousin, John Mark, with them on the trip. And Paul said, listen, Barney, uh, Mark deserted us on the first journey. We're not going to take him on the second journey. And so there was a rift between Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Silas left to go to Asia And Barnabas and his cousin Mark went to the island of Cyprus. Now, I think it's awesome that Paul mentions Mark in this greeting because Paul and Mark had a falling out. They had a disagreement. And yet, we know that Paul forgave Mark and subsequently received Mark because in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, Paul said that Mark was useful to me in the ministry. So I think it's really great that he mentions Mark. Number three, let's come to the third person that's mentioned here. It's Aristarchus in verse 24. It means the best or the first. He's from Thessalonica. Um, Aristarchus was with Paul in Acts chapter 19 there in Ephesus. Uh, You remember when Demetrius the silversmith caused a big uproar because the uh, idle trade had fallen off, stocks were crashing, people were losing their businesses of making idols because people were turning from the, the idol of Diana or Artemis to Jesus Christ and there was a big uproar. I think it's interesting, uh, the idol business fell off not because of protests, not because of politics or programs, but because of the preaching of the gospel. And, and I think it really paints a beautiful picture for us. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to protesting and programs and politics, that's not what we're saying. But what really is going to change the heart of man is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where true change comes from. You know, I heard a pastor once say that uh, because culture is so 
dramatically changed over the years. We need to change the gospel to fit the culture. Are you kidding me? The culture doesn't change the gospel. It's the gospel that changes the culture. <laughs> it's the Word of God that touches our heart and transforms our life. Sally wrote a little book about that, by the way. Touched and Transformed. You can get it at any book. No. no. <laughs> In Acts chapter 20, Arist <laughs> and moving on. In Acts, and, and if you want a signed copy, no. You know, yesterday we had the artist of market out there, and she had her books out there, and I was trying to, you know, sell them. I said, hey, I know the author. I can get you a signature, you know. <laughs> In Acts chapter 20, Aristarchus had accompanied Paul to Jerusalem to give the offering for the poor. In Acts 27, uh, he went with Paul to Rome on that slave ship. In Colossians 4.10, Aristarchus was a fellow prisoner, another, uh, you know, prison rat with Paul. Now, let's come to the fourth person that's mentioned here. It's Demas. His name means governor of the people, according to verse 24. Now, Demas is mentioned three times in the New Testament. Uh, in here in Philemon, verse 24, it says Demas is a fellow laborer. Now, back in Colossians 4.14, it says Demas greets you. But in Paul's last letter, in 2 Timothy 4.10, it says Demas has forsaken me. And you know, as we put the only three places this guy's ever mentioned in the New Testament together, it really paints a very sad downward spiral of this guy's life. Because he started out as a laborer, then he became a greeter, and subsequently wound up as a forsaker. And we know why, by the way. According to 2 Timothy chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says that he loved this present world. Now understand, in 2 Timothy, Paul was in Rome, not at the Praetorium Guardhouse. He was in the Mamertine prison, in the deepest, darkest, dampest dungeons of Rome. In fact, he was at the end of his life. It says he was being poured out like a drink offering. So here is Paul on his deathbed, and Demas is in Rome. He sees all of the splendor and majesty of Rome, the pomp, the circumstance, the food, the music, the colors, the Colosseum. It was a glorious thing from a worldly standpoint. And he ended up loving this present world more than his Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, there's nothing wrong with having the things of the world. Don't misunderstand. Maybe God's blessed you with a lot of stuff. Great. That's not a problem long as you own this stuff and the stuff doesn't own you. I think we should be good stewards of what God's entrusted to us. We should keep it shiny and clean and keep it working well. But the point is, look, it's all going to burn. It's all firewood. <laughs> it's all, 2 Peter 3.10 says the earth is going to melt with fervent heat. Everything we have is firewood. Now, some of us got some really nice firewood. <laughs> and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to make sure the priority in our life is Jesus Christ, not the world. Well, let's come to the fifth and final person, and that, of course, is Luke in verse 24. Luke, my fellow laborer. His name means light giving. He, of course, wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. Colossians 4.14 tells us he was Paul's beloved physician. He was a doctor. In Acts 16, he was a traveling companion with Paul. So here Paul lists five people in this greeting, if you will, which brings us to the second and final aspect of Paul's parting words for Philemon. We said it involved greetings, but number two and finally, it involves grace. Grace. Look at verse 25. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now this, of course, is a typical salutation a typical greeting and closing type of salutation uh, in that period of time, like aloha, hello, goodbye, you, you know what I'm saying? But I think in the context, it's much, much more. Because the word charis, uh, used 156 times in the New Testament, means unmerited favor, getting what we don't deserve. 
And the context in dealing with forgiveness becomes significant because God gives us what we don't deserve, which is forgiveness. And here, I believe Paul mentions grace as the resource you and I need to be able to have forgiveness toward others. When we receive God's grace, we now have the resource, the power we need to be able to say, I love you, I forgive you. Everything's forgiven, everything's forgotten. It's all good. And when we receive God's grace, now we have the resource, the empowerment, the enablement to be able to do just that. And like Paul at the end of verse 25, I too say amen. (laughs) Amen, Lord. Let it be so in my life. Father, how thankful we are for this little book, but such a powerful and important book for all of us, as no doubt all of us at one point in our life or another have to deal with these issues of forgiveness. And Lord, I just thank you for your great grace that enables us to do just that. That, Lord, we can go above and beyond the call of duty. That we would have your heart in the matter. Lord, that we would have your spirit, your grace enabling and empowering us to be those vessels you would choose to use to bring hope and life to those who forsake in you. Let it be so, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? Hey, if you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors, the brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you. Uh, Maybe you're listening live on the radio or on the website. Be sure to call the church if you need prayer. Love to pray with you as well. And don't forget, this Wednesday night, we're going to try to have our very last outdoor service. The weather has been so nice this month so far, and uh, we're going to just, by faith, have this first Wednesday of the month outside, communion, barbecue, fellowship, extended time of worship. It should be a great time under the stars, worshiping the Lord. Might be a little cool. Bring a sweater, blanket, uh, and if the weather's really bad, we'll, of course, be indoors. So either way, we'll have a blessed time uh, worshiping and having communion. And don't forget the shoe boxes are out there. And I noticed that the high schoolers are out there cooking breakfast. Oh, yeah. So you might want to partake in that as well. God bless you guys. I love you so much. And I pray that God would continue to fill you with His Spirit. Man, that you would just draw so close to him this week and you would feel his love, his presence, his power, his great grace working in you and through you. God bless you guys. Have a great week in the Lord.